Good afternoon. My name is Steven Cicciliano. I'm the board president of the Traverse Area Historical Society, and I welcome you to our February program. The Traverse Area Historical Society is a nonprofit 501c3, and our mission is to present, preserve, and protect the history of our region uh, and beyond. Activities include programs such as this, historical tours, which we will begin in the springtime and go through the autumn. We support our, the archives of the Traverse Area District Library, as well as history scholarships including the Michigan History Day scholarships that uh, support our local middle and high school students in participating in becoming young historians. We are an all volunteer organization. We have no paid positions. We're governed by a board of directors and we meet monthly and the meetings are open to the public. We meet upstairs in the uh, Nelson room upstairs here in the uh, library. The revenues from memberships and donations are, are enable us to put on events like today. Today's program uh, features General George Armstrong Custer at the Battle of Rio Hill. Jeffrey Yeager will present a critical analysis of General Custer's performance at the battle, a brief and minor cavalry raid conducted largely as a diversion from the Dagler, uh, sorry, Daggren, uh, Affair, Rio Hill was the only contested action fought in Charlottesville, Virginia during the Civil War. Federal troops were led by General Custer who made many of the mistakes that characterized his career in death. Battle analysis done during a 2016 staff ride reveals good examples of modern combined armed tactics and lessons learned that can be applied to future. And so without further ado, please welcome Jeffrey Yeager. Okay. I'm not gonna be that formal. Um, so thank you, Professor, um, both for your kind introduction uh, and the ability uh, to share something of a personal interest of mine. Um, very briefly about how we got to this point. Um, I am currently a student over at NMC um, I'm a junior cadet at the Maritime Academy, where I'm training to drive all those big lake craters you might see going through the straits and whatnot. So um, this is very much a third career for me, um, but I happen to be working at the library one day over at NMC campus and just having a chat with one of the librarians about uh, some interest I had in some Civil War history because I lived in Virginia for about five years and one of those former careers. Um, Back in 2016, when I graduated from Michigan State University, um, I was commissioned as an Army officer. Um, one of the requirements uh, to do that is that you conduct something called a staff ride. Uh, a staff ride is a, can't you really use the word tour? It is a guided study of a military engagement. Um, every Army officer uh, that we have today has done this before they can commission. Um, it is part of, it's a graded evaluation. Um, if you can't go through a uh, military action um, and not evaluate the leadership uh, that carried our forces through those battles, you have no business leading American troops. And so that's why we uh, still do it to this day. Most of my classmates were taken to Gettysburg, um, which is considerably more significant than what we'll talk about today. The reason why I ended up researching uh, the Battle of Rye Hill is because Charlottesville has a very interesting history. If you have ever heard of it, you either went to UVA or remember the riots that happened there in 2017, um, where I was working at the police department there. Um, I had the misfortune to be in the middle of that uh, and the subsequent fallout um, that happened to that city. Um, before that, it's um, a very small regional city in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. Um, for its size as a very distinguished history, um, it has existed six years longer than the United States. It was plotted in 1770 um, and was most famous for being the chosen home of Thomas Jefferson, whose house Monticello is up on the hill just above the city. Uh, more strangely for Virginia, it was never burned down during the Civil War. Most other cities in Virginia, 
uh, were heavily, heavily damaged during the fighting. Virginia has had more American troops killed on its soil than any other state in the United States. Between the Revolution, the Civil War, more people have fought and died in Virginia than anywhere else in this country, except for Charlottesville. This is the only battle that happened there um, when federal forces returned in 1865 under General Sheridan. Uh, General Early had already been defeated at the Battle of and the federal column simply moved over Rockfish Gap, over those mountains, and stayed in Charlottesville about three days before heading on to Richmond. Um, so this is a little strange. I was moved to Virginia, um, having done uh, this research, and was surprised by that. How is it that a city in Virginia survived the destruction that characterized the burning of the Shenandoah Valley, what uh, Sheridan did, there's so many other communities in the area. How did Charlottesville survive and why? Um, the more I looked into this, I was surprised to learn that one of uh, Michigan's favorite heroes uh, was responsible for saving the city, not because he wanted to, but quite frankly, because he's a bit inept at his job. Um, and we all know how that turned out at Little Bighorn. Uh, 34th out of 34 in West Point. It's, there's an asterisk to that. Uh, half his class had already dropped out to join the Confederacy when he graduated, um, but still. Uh, he also still holds the record, I believe it was 724, 28. He has the record for the most demerits of any cadet that has managed to graduate from West Point. Um, apparently had a lifelong love of practical jokes and the Commandant did not like it. So. Uh, that's just a little bit about how we got here, why this research ever happened and such a uh, minor engagement. So I will uh, actually get into the program now. So uh, today what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the strategic situation surrounding the battle at the time. Um, as uh, Professor Siciliano mentioned, um, this was largely conducted as a diversion um, from a larger operation that was occurring in Richmond the same day. Um, we talk a little bit about how the battle uh, actually happened um, and the implications, um, really non-consequential as far as the course of the Civil War, but for General Custer, um, had he been a little more introspective, he may well have survived Little Bighorn and gone on to uh, who knows what, uh, what heights he may have achieved. And again, it is Custer. So uh, how many people are familiar with Virginia, uh, Central Virginia area? Okay, a few of us. Um, so today, Charlottesville it lies on the I-64 corridor. It is about um, an hour away from Richmond um, and is the largest city by far in its area. Um, the next largest city is called Stanton, um, which is famous for absolutely nothing except being home to Woodrow Wilson. Um, so more geographically, Charlottesville is about 15 miles from the Scottsville crossing of the James River, which is one of Virginia's only navigable rivers. Um, it flows uh, past Richmond um, down into the Chesapeake Bay. So when Charlottesville was founded, uh, that was one of its primary means of trade, uh, was the bateau trade down the James River. Um, the tributary river of the James that Charlottesville actually lies on the banks of is called the Rivanna River. Um, and that helped as um, industry came in the post-colonial times, uh, that helped to build up Charlottesville uh, as a manufacturing center. The mills are still there. They're called the Woolen Mills because they manufactured the majority of uniforms for the Confederate armies. Um, it is now actually condos, interestingly enough, but that's how, it's condos. They, they took the old mill building. Um, it still looks the same, um, but they put the headquarters of a computer company and condos in it. So you can still see them at least, um, kind of interesting. A little bit like what's happened with the uh, state hospital and that sort of redevelopment. Um, but that's still there. That was the primary industry for Charlottesville. And in addition, we have the University of Virginia. Now, during the war, uh, this was repurposed to serve as the primary uh, hospital for the Army of Northern Virginia. So those critically injured soldiers from General Lee's army uh, would be evacuated to Charlottesville for long-term treatment. And that was essentially its primary function um, for the Confederacy was a supply depot and a medical station. So I have to confess, I made this uh, PowerPoint uh, to teach to police officers um, in Virginia 
when you are learning to uh, get the certification to teach police academy, they make you make a presentation about anything of your choosing. So this is more geared towards cops. Um, you'll see, I kind of dumbed it down a little from what I did in 2016, but um, you'll see the modern day uh, street map of Charlottesville. It's kind of the reason why we chose those maps. Um, oh, I forgot, I can't leave the podium. So um, the sites that I've identified here, these five sites are the primary uh, objectives, um, sites of interest that would have um, been assigned to General Custer as he prepared to raid. Um, and you can see it in comparison to the modern day street map. Um, which again was to help those local area policemen get a little more in touch with their history. So uh, you see down there um, to the southeast, uh, close to Thomas Jefferson's house, uh, that is the Virginia Central Railroad Bridge over the Rivanna River. Um, this also still does exist. It is quite an impressive, um, oh, what's the word? It's a very long, uh, very tall uh, stone rail bridge, um, which has only had a few people jump off of it. <laughs> quite tall. Um, going further into the city, um, still the uh, rail junction um, at the old uh, Water Street rail station um, still has an active Amtrak line, um, and the tracks are owned by Norfolk Southern. So it's still, still highly used. Um, the old train station is not. They shifted the station down about 10 blocks, um, but again, still exist. Um, just yet another example of why I looked into this at all, because Charlottesville is one of those places that um, you know, until recently was, was history at every corner. Um, you can walk through and it has not changed in 300 years. Um, the Woolen Mills, like I was talking about, um, you see the river that uh, flows past the southeast of the city. Uh, UVA Hospital, um, the modern hospital is a couple blocks away from where it would have been at the time of the raid. Um, if you've ever seen a picture of the Rotunda, very famous building designed by Thomas Jefferson, and is uh, now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. That was the main building that they'd used as a military hospital. Um, some have speculated that's why Sheridan did not burn it on his way through after the Battle of Waynesboro, um, that it was you know, Thomas Jefferson's building. Uh, he just didn't take the time. Sheridan was very fond of burning things. Uh, and up at the top, you'll see uh, the current Rivanna Reservoir which was not dammed at the time. It was still a free flowing river. So um, all of the blue portion you see to the left of the battle site um, would have been considerably narrower. Um, this is not a large reservoir, um, but the river is still only about 20 to 50 yards wide, um, depending where you go. Um, so at, this reservoir now is about 200 yards wide. Um, it would have been considerably smaller back then. Um, so, as we talked about a little bit um, with the manufacturing in the hospital, with the supply depot function of Charlottesville, this was the main reason it was chosen for the raid. It had six rail lines that ran through the city. This was the most of any city in Virginia. Um, it had been used, uh, the lines were laid along old colonial roads, um, including the very famous three-notched road where the Virginia colonial government fled after being um, tipped off that they're gonna be arrested by the British army and was actually why Charlottesville was the capital of Virginia for about three weeks. Um, so the confluent, uh, confluence of all these rail lines is chiefly why it was chosen. Uh, the Civil War has been talked about in terms of military logistics because it was the first war anywhere in the world where rail was the primary means of both troop movement and logistics resupply. So with that new development in mind, as they were choosing diversionary targets to draw uh, Confederate troops away from Richmond, that's how Charlottesville came up. All right, what's going on before this raid? Well, uh, the mine run campaign was ongoing. Um, it was primarily infantry uh, and cavalry, uh, not a lot of artillery um, that was being moved. Essentially, Lee's army, the federal troops were chasing each other around and never could quite find each other. Neither was willing to set a battlefield. Um, the county north of Charlottesville is called Orange, very hilly, very densely wooded, um, still to this day is extremely rural. 
and they're just playing a game of cat and mouse until it came to the winter. Um, it does not snow a lot in Virginia, certainly not like it does here, but what it does do is rain. And the roads back then, um, especially in this rural part of the state, uh, were so bad that they became too money to use. Um, so General Meade, in his pursuit of Lee, w did end up having to uh, overwinter his army starting in about the middle of October, um, simply because he could not move his troops in expeditious fashion. Um, General Stewart's army, meanwhile, on the Confederate side, um, hunkered down in Albemarle County, which is the county that surrounds Charlottesville. So without knowing it, they were about 30 miles apart for the duration of the winter. Um, and during that time, both of them were preparing for the overland and wilderness campaigns, um, the wilderness being uh, very famous for where uh, General Jackson was killed by his own troops in a, in a silly, avoidable accident. But there you have it. That is war. The reason that we needed or that the Confederacy needed a diversion was for something that became known as the Dahlgren Affair after it happened. Um, there's a very infamous prisoner of war camp in the city limits of Richmond, about an hour away um, by car today. It's about 70 miles um, at the Belle Isle prison. Um, and it were held several thousand uh, Union officers and soldiers in truly horrific conditions. The POW camps um, used by both armies during this war were, well, the Andersonville prison run by the Confederate army actually ended up having some of the only war crimes convictions of the whole war because of the condition that the POWs were kept in. So uh, the Union came up with an idea. So what if we could sneak into Richmond, the most heavily defended city in the Confederacy, its capital, and free the prisoners? We'll arm them, and we'll do what the Union Army does best. We'll set the whole city on fire. Um, once you're past the defenses and you have access to those prisoners, it's a 3,000-man trained army that you can use to attack the city from the inside. The reason why Dahlgren Affair became salacious is because carried on the body of Colonel uh, Dahlgren, who was um, not the commander, but the second in command of one of the raiding forces, were orders assigning him to assassinate the entire cabinet of the Confederacy. Um, at the time, this was not considered uh, the law of civilized war. Uh, when those orders were discovered, uh, the war secretary of the uh, federal side, um, Mr. Stanton, uh, was alleged to have um, personally issued those orders to Colonel Kilpatrick, who was the commander of the raid, and uh, Colonel Dahlgren. Um, Dahlgren was shot off his horse by a volunteer picket force as he was trying to raid Richmond. The raid never actually happened. Um, they were cut off by the defenses and never made inside the city limits, but these orders were discovered um, on him. Actually had to have President Lincoln personally inform General Lee that he had not authorized the assassinations because it had the potential to cause a mutiny amongst the federal troops. This is this is how out of character this was considered at the time. And General, I'm sorry, Mr. Stanton um, tried to disavow himself, um, but the Smithsonian Institute in only about 2010 did handwriting analysis that proved that he was the one who had ordered the assassinations. Um, so despite the failure of the raid, the original concept was that the federal troops would draw as many of the forces away from Richmond as possible. Like I said, it is the most heavily defended city in the Confederacy. If this raid is going to have any chance of success, we need to reduce the number of defenses, the number of available troops by as much as possible. And in the army, this is what we call setting the battlefield, is before actually engaging the enemy, we want to prepare the battlefield to our satisfaction before we take the last final step off the edge and commit to action with the enemy. So this is part of their preparation. Several targets were identified and Charlottesville is ultimately selected. At this time, General Custer is in the area with the Federal Cavalry and he's in command of US volunteers, um, which is how he came to be associated with Michigan. He is from Ohio, but he was commanding uh, the Michigan Cavalry Brigade of the Federal Cavalry um, 
under General Pendleton. So he is dispatched to draw all those forces away. He's dispatched with 1,500 mounted cavalry. Uh, he has in draw one battery, that is four 10-pound field cannons, very light cannon, um, which will come into play. In defense of Charlottesville, like I said, it is not, there are no combat formations in Charlottesville. Um, thank you. Um, there's no combat formations here. There's a warehouse and a train station and a hospital. The only defenses are 200 troops with four batteries of cannon. Um, as you can see here, this is a parrot gun. Um, parrot is the name of the inventor. It has nothing to do with birds, um, but it is a light cannon that can be easily drawn by a single horse um, and generally loaded with shot. It is not meant to bombard. It is an anti-infantry weapon. Um, that was a primary means that Charlottesville had at, available for its defense. Um, as I said, 200 troops are the only combat available forces in Charlottesville. Um, you can see the quite a mismatch in forces. So Custer is well provisioned to make his attack. Um, we are going to run into a couple issues of how this raid all fell apart. Again, going back to the modern day street map, if you're from the area, uh, you may recognize the uh, 29 corridor there. Um, but it just helps give our modern audiences a little bit more context in terms of distances rather than trying to do this on the original campaign map. So um, starting up at the north, um, Madison Courthouse um, is the next uh, two counties up from Charlottesville. Um, this is a distance of about 40 miles. Um, and though a national park is laid out today, it is heavily, heavily impassable terrain. There are only um, about three gaps at the time that could be transited, um, one of which is just off the map right here. Um, that would be Rockfish, um, where General Sheridan would come through a couple months after this. And then further to the north, um, kind of just south of where you see Swift Run um, at that 33 crossing, that's Jarman's Gap. Um, over the winter, this is in February, remember, uh, nobody's getting through there. So there's very little screening conducted and consequently, no reconnaissance was ever conducted um, before General Custer committed to action. So this is a mistake he was well known for. Uh, jumping in with both feet, um, he intentionally wore an exceptionally gaudy uniform uh, of his own creation so that people could see him running around like a maniac. It's just what he did. He didn't like to stop and think for things. Um, We'll see how that plays out for him. On February 28th, he is with those 1500 cavalry in Madison. He is reprovisioned um, and received his orders. The Dahlgren raid is going to happen this night. These are the defenses available. Uh, the main city is about here. So this is about four to five miles from the main bulk of the city uh, where the warehouses and hospitals are. Um, General McClellan has ordered him as a primary goal to burn all the railroad bridges that he encounters. Again, those six rail lines, if they can be cut, that would prevent most of the uh, provisioning efforts as General Lee is preparing for mine run. Um, I'm sorry, wilderness. So with the knowledge that the entire West is blocked by terrain, uh, the Confederates have arranged themselves over the only road route um, that comes from the north, which to this day is still uh, known as the Route 29. And you can see they've made an artillery camp um, just north of the city limits and uh, placed guns covering bridges to the west. They're able to engage bridges. Um, and then the second half of their batteries are covering the road itself. Um, up at the top, uh, the 29 bridge obviously was not there. Uh, in the 1800s, but you have uh, a flour mill um, and the main road bridge um, that would have been the north approaches. So early in the morning, Custer's column comes down to that mill bridge. 
along the way uh, at Earliesville, he's captured a couple of the Confederate pickets because they actually have set out observation posts. Um, again, General Custer conducted no reconnaissance. The main body of his column captures these pickets. Um, and they actually informed Custer that General Lee's entire cavalry division was camped at Charlottesville. Had Custer done any reconnaissance or even read his own military intelligence, he would know that Charlottesville did not even have the capacity to hold a brigade worth of cavalry, let alone the entire Army of Northern Virginia's cavalry forces. It could not be done. But he captured them, the Confederates lied, and he believes them. So he's now expecting to meet up to 4,000 cavalry troopers. Remember, there's only 200 artillerymen with a couple cannons. Um, Good luck to him. The Confederates are conducting their own reconnaissance uh, at the time of this movement um, before General Custer has crossed the bridge and they report back uh, the presence of a large cavalry column um, to Captain Mormon, who is in command at Charlottesville. Captain Mormon attempts to dispatch half of his batteries. Um, now that he knows uh, where the column is coming from, he abandons the preset firing posts on those western bridges and attempts to reinforce that mill bridge, but he's too late. Uh, again, the only horse he has available are his draft horses to drag the cannons. Um, these are not cavalry horses, so by the time they get there, Custer has already overrun the bridge. General Custer was very fond of splitting his commands. It's very funny because... To this day in the United States Army, we talk a lot about the doctrine of massing fires. Um, so if anybody's been watching the news recently, um, this has to do quite a bit more with the Navy than the Army, but is a policy across the United States that we tend not to engage our enemies until we have overwhelming forces. Uh, some fellows there in Yemen got a hold of a few rocket launchers and started shooting at a lot of our merchant ships. And we didn't respond to the concern of the American public for several weeks. Well, we were conducting reconnaissance and we were conducting an operation called massing fires. We were moving multiple guided missile destroyers into position so that we could dictate the battle on our terms. Custer seems to think that he knows better than this concept. He consistently throughout his career chooses to split his commands in a day and age where, where there are no radios, there are no cell phones, he has no ability to communicate with his subordinates once he sends them off. He issues orders, they go away, he has to trust that they're going to happen as he scripts out his battle. And in war, it so rarely happens the way that we draw it out on paper. So on the left, you'll see the main body of the column with about a thousand cavalrymen. This is where General Custer remains. Um, and then he dispatches Captain Ash, my apologies. Uh, Captain Ash takes about 500 troops with him, um, and he is ordered eastwards um, to find a suitable fording location um, across the Rybana River. The General Custer did this because he had encountered um, those reinforcements that Captain Mormon had sent forward to attempt to hold the bridge. Well, they shot at each other ineffectually, and Custer believes that this is the vanguard of a cavalry division. So he is now attempting to conduct a pincer movement and attack an un what he believes to be an unprotected flank um, of the main body of his imaginary cavalry opponent. Um, and so that's why Captain Ash is sent over to the east. Uh, Captain Norman at this time has realized that his position is indefensible against overwhelming odds, and he is now uh, bounding backwards. That is, he would set half of his batteries uh, to fire at the approaching troopers while the other half were hooked up to their horses and dragged backwards a couple hundred yards at a time. When they get back, the forward batteries are then hooked up, dragged back. So there's continuous harassing fire, but it's largely ineffectual. They're shooting over the cavalry's heads. Um, where the camp is, is uh, to this day, a very significant hill, Rio Hill, you know, great naming convention. Um, the problem with that is that the guns are death allotted downwards. So they're trying to elevate the guns as much as possible on their carriages, um, but they're unable to aim effectually. They're either sending the shot into the ground uh, at short range 
or they're trying to mortar the realms. Um, like I said, harassing fire only, it's largely ineffectual. As Custer advances, Captain Dash finds his ford uh, and makes it across the Rivanna River. Um, Captain Mormon has decided that this is where he's going to make his stand and sets his four batteries on a line um, and prepares. Uh, the situation is looking so desperate for him that he actually orders his troops to take the ramrods of their cannons and wave them around like pikes and sabers in an attempt to uh, intimidate the cavalry into thinking they have more weapons than they actually do. Uh, these artillerymen are armed primarily with single-shot pistols and light sword. Uh, not looking good for them at all. Luckily or unluckily, depending on whose side you're on, uh, General Custer overruns the camp almost immediately, which forces Captain Mormon's hand. Um, he sends his own flanking force, smearing his enemy around uh, to Custer's right flank, um, where the 1,000 cavalry troopers are more or less milling about. Remember, they're on a search and destroy raid. They're there to burn things and break as many things as possible and degrade the Confederate forces as much as possible. They're picking up what they can at this point, the bits of supply that the Confederates have left behind in their old camp. Uh, and Captain Mormon takes advantage of that to conduct his own flanking movement. Um, here again, we see the problem with splitting our forces. Captain Ash has still not arrived. General Custer still is operating under the assumption that he has an entire division facing him. When this flanking movement occurs, he believes that this is the main body attacking him. Um, there are less than 100 troops involved in this. He severely, severely overestimates uh, how many troops are coming after his right flank. To that end, he splits his forces again uh, and prepares a hasty defense um, by forming two lines um, to try to envelop that attack. Meanwhile, the batteries are now able to fire at the backs and flanks of his own troops, and they begin to do so with more effect. Um, however, we are still loaded with light shot, so very few uh, federal troops are put out of action at this time. Uh, Captain Mormon is now ordering his own camp to be destroyed, and the cannons are doing their best. Um, And then here's the fun part. Kester leaves. He's under orders to destroy no less than six railroad bridges. He's under orders to burn the town if possible. He is under orders to degrade the enemy's ability to do combat. And he leaves. He has attacked one camp, a temporary camp supporting 16 cannons. Why would he do this? He heard a train. Let's think about this for a second. He is attacking a known railroad depot for the purpose of it being a railroad junction. And he hears a train. He never listens to military intelligence. General Custer considered himself too good for that. He's the man on the ground. He's a man of action. He's going to go find out his own intelligence. He believes it's a troop train. The Union Army knew that only supply trains came through Charlottesville. But he believes it is a troop train delivering reinforcements from General Lee's army, which is camped in Orange County, the opposite direction that he heard the train approaching from. At the same time, he has ordered his troops to destroy the artillery camp, and they have done so with great gusto, including setting the ammunition caissons on fire. Well, when you set exploding shells near a flame, they tend to blow up. And they did so, which he believed was incoming artillery fire. General Custer, being faced with 100 men armed with sticks, now believes he is under a division sized cavalry counterattack supported by heavy artillery and withdraws his 1,000 cavalry troops. Captain Ash, meanwhile, has entered the camp and is firing at Custer's troops because he too believes that he is under heavy artillery fire and that the Confederates have not yet abandoned the camp. You see the problem with splitting our forces and no ability to communicate. The column rejoins itself and flees northwards. Captain Mormon 
has no ability to pursue and does not make an attempt. Uh, his objective is simply the defense of the city, and he has, by all miracles, accomplished this, again, using sticks. General Custer leaves the way he came, burns the flowering mill and the bridge, and returns. All told, one wounded Federal Cavalry Trooper. He lived. On the Confederate side, two captured. Um, we talked about those two pickets that Custer captured uh, between Earliesville and Standardsville. Um, those are the only prisoners that he managed to take. Uh, two horses were captured. Uh, draft horses, fairly useless for cavalry action. Um, and equipment and horses were lost, uh, amounting to a degradation of two of the four Confederate batteries. So two batteries put temporarily out of action. The other two batteries remained combat effective. Um, this is a fun sketch um, that I believe you can still see on the internet, um, but I saw the original at the Charlottesville Area Historical Society, um, and this is one of the after action sketches that was prepared by Custer's staff um, detailing the battle damage. Um, this is the actual burning of that mill bridge, um, which incidentally was about the only damage he actually managed to cause the city. Jumping ahead a couple decades, I know, we're going a little bit out of order. Uh, after General Custer is killed at Little Bighorn, his wife, God bless her, spends the next six decades writing a series of books with artistic liberty. Uh, she wrote at least three books uh, that are advertised as biographical, creating the myth of General Custer. Uh, it is one of the reasons why Little Bighorn is still known to this day. Um, without Elizabeth Custer's <clears throat> attempts to rehabilitate uh, her husband's image, um, Little Bighorn would be a footnote on the Indian Wars. Um, now, that's not to say that Elizabeth did it all on her own. Throughout his entire life, General Custer, uh, long before uh, we came into the day and age of uh, President Trump, the modern presidential campaign, General Custer understood the power of media, and he spent much of his career, um, shall we say, exaggerating for a personal gain. This is one of the reasons he was a brevet general at 23, even though he managed to miss the Gettysburg campaign. He couldn't find the Battle of Gettysburg. It was the largest military action ever conducted on U.S. soil, and he couldn't find it. But he was able to convince a lot of people through some uh, revisionism. Uh, he was quite a bit more capable than he believed. Uh, to this end, we've talked about what actually happened at Rio Hill. This is what he told General McClellan. He destroyed a bridge over the Rivanna River. That is true. He burned three flouring mills filled with grain. He burned one. Claims to have captured six caissons, two forges with all of their tack, and a standard bearing the arms of Virginia. This is not that flag. This is the flag carried by General Jackson's troops because artillery batteries do not carry their own colors. They are not a sizable enough formation. Um, but by claiming to have captured arms, this would prove to General McClellan that he had encountered a much larger force than he actually did. Captured over 50 prisoners. Wow. That's a lot more than two. 500 horses and associated contraband. Well, he certainly didn't turn them over to the Army of the Potomac. He claims to have lost them en route. As a side note, after the surrender at Appomattox, uh, he was credibly accused of stealing a $10,000 racehorse which he also claims to have lost. It was found a year later, shot in the head. Big fan of horses, this one. And a large camp of the enemy was captured and destroyed near Charlottesville. So these totals include uh, his march from Madison. Um, so there is 
there is some belief um, that he was at this time simply um, adding up as much as he could from several different actions. Um, certainly his movement from General McClellan's encampment could have reasonably assumed uh, to have destroyed somewhat more equipment. Uh, the issue was he was marching mostly through federal controlled territory. So um, in my humble opinion, uh, this is largely invention. Let's be honest. If he actually told General McClellan what happened at Charlottesville, it would be highly embarrassing, an absolute career ender. Um, he ended the Civil War considering a career in mining. This is not a man who, this is a man who really desperately wanted to be a cavalry commander. Uh, he liked the image. He liked this idea that the newspapers all portrayed him as this dashing sort of cavalier fellow, quite a larger than life personality. He's Audie Murphy before Audie Murphy existed. It, he wanted to be the face of the United States Army. Fortunately, you lie for so long that eventually the bill comes due. And this is what happens at Little Bighorn. After the Civil War, uh, he has to make several petitions um, through General Sheridan, through General Grant, uh, to remain in the Army. Um, but he is only allowed to stay at a reduced rank of lieutenant colonel. At the time of Little Bighorn, he was not even in command of a cavalry formation. He was the executive officer, and his boss was away at a meeting um, when the U.S. Army received intelligence uh, of a large encampment um, that could be destroyed by a quick cavalry mission. So... What does Rio Hill have to do with General Custer's death at Little Bighorn? Well, once again, he makes the critical error to separate his forces. Um, this is one of the most widely cited reasons why the federal attack went so poorly at Little Bighorn is because they were unable to mass their forces. Um, considering, again, that he is a cavalry commander, um, is not what we would consider cavalry in the modern army. We can just get out of our vehicles and leave them there if we are not fighting the vehicle. Um, back then, you would have to have every fourth man just stand there and hold on to your horses while the other three fought. So not only has he divided his forces in two, but he's also degraded his total firepower by a quarter. Um, the Indians had very little trouble overwhelming such a reduced ability by his own choosing once he chose to dismount. Um, like we said at the beginning, he was dispatched to Charlottesville um, with cannon in tow. Now again, we have to remember the image he's created for himself. He's a cowboy. He wears this big fancy uniform, giant feather in his hat. He wants to be seen. This is the first war that was photographed and he took advantage of that. Well, in his mind, it's not a very cavalry thing to do to move slowly, taking cannons in tow. So at Charlottesville, he left them behind. He did not engage the Confederate camp with any artillery uh, and was down to fighting pistol and saber against an enemy that he knew was reinforced with artillery. Although he overestimated it, he didn't know about the cannons and he simply thought that he could overrun them. Um, so too at Little Bighorn. He had available to him a battery of Gatling guns. Uh, considering the enemy that he was fighting, it's true. He had a couple hundred cavalrymen to face um, widely uh, varying estimates, but no less than 1,800 Indians. Um, that one battery of Gatling guns, however, would have increased his nominal firepower by at least 400%. Uh, considering that he chose to dismount anyway, this would have absolutely made all the difference, considering the tactics employed by the Indians, which are more reminiscent of the Red Army than anything else. They tended to just throw themselves at you in a wave, and that's exactly what they did at Little Bighorn and overwhelmed him at that hill. But it's not his style. It's not flashy. It won't get him in the news that he mowed down a lot of enemies with a machine gun. So he leaves them behind. And we know what happened. And here again, is his problem with his self-image. This idea that he's riding around the country, saving the day, being the hero, 
very dashing on the top of his horse. How just think about how tall you have to be sitting on top of that horse, standing in the saddle, waving your troops on. Come on, you Wolverines. So photogenic. That's all he does. He doesn't know how to fight dismounted. He does not know how to combine forces, conduct complex arms, combined arms warfare. He cannot do it. He has built this image. He has convinced himself that he is a more capable commander than he is, and this gets him killed. He is raiding an artillery reinforced position, a fixed position, mind you, which to this day is a very big deal for the army. We do not lightly attack a known defended emplacement, and he simply thinks that if he can just ride fast enough, the enemy will simply flee in terror from his big feathery hat. Indians are not so easily frightened like the Confederates. All they have to do is stand there and shoot and shoot back and let Custer destroy himself through panic, through a lack of preparation, through a lack of intelligence, and he is killed along with his entire command. So, wrapping up, uh, we've talked about this little battle um, that nobody remembers. It is literally memorialized in Charlesville only by a sign on the sign of a subway. But we can think about the lessons that had General Custer maybe been a little bit more introspective, how things might have turned out differently for him. Certainly he enjoyed the love of the nation after Appomattox. General Sheridan was perhaps not so convinced, which is why he was bumped down to Lieutenant Colonel and barely managed to join the Indian Wars. But maybe he would have lived longer. Maybe he would have actually earned some success if he had talked about what we talk about today. Um, and so back to the very beginning, that's why the US Army to this day does these staff rights. It's not about the battle. It's not about the tactics. Nobody died in this battle. It's a footnote in history. So why even talk about it? Because for this man and for the men he commanded at Little Bighorn, if he had looked back, if he had looked at himself, if he had actually been critical of his own weaknesses, of his own strengths, but if he had thought about it for himself, like we're thinking about him today, those men might not have been killed. Those families wouldn't have been altered forever. And that's why the army teaches us to do this. That is certainly a lesson that I have taken for a long time. And I believe that's why the interest was brought up on this concept of the staff writer when I was talking with Professor Siciliano, is that's what we do at the Maritime Academy. Is a tough, tough job in unforgiving conditions, and you are trapped on that ship with 20 men, and we take high school students here, and in four years, they'll be officers in charge of those crew, crew that are more experienced than them, crew that know more than shipping about them. All we've done here is gotten them to pass a licensing exam. So thinking about our own weaknesses, it saves not just our lives, but the lives of the people we're responsible for. And it's certainly something that I hope that we will continue to improve upon at the Maritime Academy. And we start with what the Army has known works for decades and decades. As we do these staff rides, we think about these things, we think what might have gone differently for General Custer. So um, that's about all I have. Um, if you have any questions, um, be happy to do so. I'm not going to have you take a quiz, and this is actually the only memorial. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> there it is. Four. Yes, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, for those of us on the Zoom, the question was how many Gatling guns are in a battery? Um, it's typically four uh, at the time, um, and still to this day is four guns to a battery. Um, be it howitzer, which is normally what we have today, uh, self-propelled towed cannon um, or rocket. Um, and this is a holdover from the old uh, British way of fighting. Um, That's how they organized um, their artillery. So with the invention of the Gatling gun, it made sense um, to the U.S. Army simply to use the same system we'd already been doing for towed artillery. Um, that is artillery that you have to physically drag with a horse. Um, 
And these Gatling guns uh, do not weigh any less than a, a Parrot gun, certainly. So um, he would have had four available um, with crews, about 20 troops to operate them. Um, and it's, you can drag them with a cavalry horse. Some people have speculated he left them behind because they didn't want to carry the ammunition. It takes up a lot more space um, than traditional artillery shells. So it's certainly more ammunition, uh, more shots to put down range. Um, but he simply didn't have the baggage capacity. He could have taken a caisson, um, a reinforced wagon is basically all it is, um, which is what he blew up at Charlottesville. But we may never know exactly why he made that last decision. Um, but it's a long answer to say it is four guns to a battery man. Um, I think it's probably common now for us to realize Custer's failures. Is there a school of thought around that you know of that still look at him as a better army leader than has been presented? I have heard elsewhere also that you know of. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, for a very long time. And, it, you know, we talk about uh, Elizabeth was our main source of information for decades and decades, um, certainly in the immediate uh, years after his death. Um, help build up that image. And not all of it is in, is untrue. He, the man is not a liar. He's simply an exaggerator. Um, and was he an effective cavalry uh, commander? Absolutely, he was. Um, I say he missed Gettysburg. He, he could not find the battle, that is true. But he improvised extremely well. Um, he did engage General uh, Stewart's cavalry uh, about two miles south of the battlefield. Um, completely unplanned attack um, and managed to delay Stuart long enough where Stuart was unable to make his assigned rendezvous with General Lee, um, which is ultimately how General Lee uh, lost that battle and quite frankly lost the war that day. So his ability to improvise is absolutely, he, he absolutely can do that. Um, his personal style, you know, I would characterize it as gaudy and and flashy, but for the time, there was something to that. Rallying your troops from the front is something we talk a lot about in the US Army right now, um, leading from the front. You need your troops to see that you are fighting harder than they are. And he actually managed to do that. Um, several historians have said that is why he chose such a um, colorful image for himself so that he could be seen. He wanted the enemy to see him. He wanted to be the center of attention so that his troops could see him from behind. Um, this is not the I hate General Custer day. <laughs> um, you, you do have a very good point. The reason why I focus so much on his failures is not because of his ineptitude. Um, there have been very many a mediocre officer across all of our branches of the military. We take so many people into this massive military machine that we've built not all of them are going to be General Washington's, certainly, but it is our ability to self-criticize that helps that person of maybe they don't have the inherent talent, but our ability to learn for ourselves. And that is his real failure. Um, and so I apologize if I, I didn't quite get that across, but yes, is he a terrible commander? No, it is his inability to self-criticize that got him his entire command killed um, and led to more of his failures than he should have had. So, ma'am. I'm in Ohio, and where is he buried? Uh, New Brumley, um, over in the east half of the state. I think it's Harrison County. Um, absolute middle of nowhere. Very tiny town. <laughs> the only thing that they have is a statue of Custer. Um, and he was originally buried at Little Bighorn, as was common for the day. Um, U.S. troops actually until Korea uh, were buried where they fell um, in military graveyards. So he was originally interred at Little Bighorn. Uh, unfortunately, in a shallow grave, digging in Dakota is not so easy. Um, and his bones were actually scattered by animals. Um, after the conclusion of the Indian Wars, the army came back to try to locate as many of our troops as they could to find out what happened and found that uh, scavenger animals had more or less dug him up 
and scattered him to the four winds. So about two armfuls of bones were all that was left, and those were reinterred at West Point. Yes. Yes. So uh, the question was, uh, was General Custer ever positively identified? Yes. Um, there's a strong oral tradition um, that we probably have all heard about um, from the Native Americans. Um, and there again, his image did kind of help. Um, they were, uh, they remembered quite well the man with the very long blonde hair uh, jumping around like a bit of a maniac um, as they were attacking him. So uh, it was actually in, dis in consultation with the natives who were there, um, who had had relatives that fought there, that they were able to identify where he fell, where he was buried, um, and by bits and pieces of his uniform, again, very distinctive. Um, he actually fell next to his brother. Um, so is it possible that some of the remains are his brothers? Yes, but we do know um, that the two bodies that were recovered or what was left of those two bodies are General Custer and his brother. Hi, thank you. Hi, I don't have a question. You're an excellent speaker. You have a good sense of humor, and it's very enjoyable. Appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, anybody else? Oh, yes, ma'am. One more. Not everybody else can ask questions. That's not. <laughs> Better off, but does this? He had no children. Is that correct? Uh, no, no children. Um, he survived only by his wife, um, who lived about 60 years after he died. He died at a very young age. Again, he was 25 at the conclusion of the Civil War. Um, I died, believe, 32, that little big one. Um, I can check his exact age when he died, but um, very young. And Elizabeth had a long life, but did not remarry, um, spent her time uh, promoting her husband and never taking another. Well, she certainly did a good job because yes, she did. Yes, she did. Very devoted. Yes. I was just going to say, you've been to the, have you been to the museum up in oh, what's the name of the town? Right below Northport. Um, it's right across from not just a bar. Can't think of it. It was closed the day I went. Pardon? It was closed the day I went. I didn't check ahead of time. I should have done reconnaissance. Well, if you go in there, they have a picture on the wall. It says our Confederate general, and they have a picture of General Custer. And my husband was from Monroe, where Custer was from, where Elizabeth was from. And I was like, what in the world do you have General Custer on the wall here for? Well, it turns out his father, who became a judge, was a um, person who went in and, and you know scouted the land. Thank you. <laughs> I knew I remember it. Um, anyway, so then he bought property. And, you know, that property is right across from not just a bar, so that would have been right there on the bay. And then when he died, it went to Elizabeth and Custer, and then they owned that property. And now the property has that museum on it. So it isn't it funny? It's such a small, small world. Is, is ultimate the whole reason I ever found out about this, I may never have moved to Virginia without asking the question, why is Fort Custer named that? Um, it's a, a major training site for the National Guard. I, I joined the Michigan National Guard um, just after my 18th birthday. Um, and the first place they sent me was Fort Custer. I said, why is it called Fort Custer? He's not even from here. He had taught school in Monroe. Um, can you imagine General Custer in an elementary school? Oh, that must have been something. But it, it really it is so funny how the world, even back then, um, before the internet and everything else, just was such a small, small place. Mm -hmm. Yep. On the town square, more or less. And uh, with, with the modern trend of taking down statues, it really came up, you know, he wasn't such a great general. Why do we have, why does he get all the statue of him? But as far as I know, it's still standing. So. Uh, to my knowledge as well, and and certainly, you know, um, besides his uh, effectiveness as a military commander, there has been considerable debate about his treatment of the Indians um, during the Indian Wars, and certainly the federal government as a whole uh, 
was not the greatest. Um, there are allegations, uh, very credible ones, that he did um, father a child by an Indian woman, um, likely against her will, um, but uh, no firm evidence. Uh, the child did not bear much of a resemblance to General Custer, so um, it is a historical rumor at best. Um, did he abuse that girl? We'll never know, um, but certainly uh, as a hometown hero of Monroe, he did command Michigan troops uh, that helped contribute to the Union victory. You know, do his indiscretions mean that he should be lost to the ages and forgotten entirely? Well, uh, I think you know my answer. I, I don't think so. Um, and interestingly, um, in Monroe County, where that statue is, I've gone down and looked at it. I was visiting the River Raisin Battlefield, which until Little Bighorn was the single worst defeat the U.S. Army ever suffered. Uh, in terms of percent casualties, River Raisin um, fought uh, against the Indian and British uh, forces um, down there by Monroe. Uh, absolute worst disaster the U.S. Army ever suffered until Little Bighorn. Coincidence. All right, well, could everyone please uh, thank Jeffrey for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you.